welcome to our God and Country this service this morning at Central Baptist Church. Let's begin our service with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for another day of life, Lord. We thank you for the privilege of spending this day in your house. Lord, we thank you for America, and Lord, we thank you for blessing her the way that you have. Father, we thank you for the fact that this land was founded on the principles found in the Word of God. Lord, I ask that you'd bless this service to come. Lord, we ask for your presence. We ask that you, Lord, would move among us this morning and do a work that only you can do. Lord, we pray a blessing upon the singing and the preaching to come that will lift up Christ. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. patriotic hymns like that, just remembering where our country came from and thankful for our Christian heritage here in the United States of America. Well, we have a few announcements this morning, but before we do that, we'd like to welcome any of our first-time guests. If you have not already received a guest card and this is your first time at Central Baptist Church, if you don't mind just raising your hand, our men would love to get you a guest card so we can have a record of your visit. We thank you for those who are vis- uh, our guests this morning and are with us here today, and you're our honored guest, and we're thankful that you chose to be with us this morning at Central Baptist Church. Well, by way of announcement, we have our, today as our God and Country service, as you can see and hear, and uh, this morning we'll be celebrating our Christian heritage and have a uh, singing that would uh, lift up not only the Lord, but honor our country, and then we'll have a message from the Word of God as well along the same theme. And then after our service today, after the invitation, 
We're going to have anybody who served in the armed forces come forward for a time of recognition and to give you a small gift uh, from the church here this morning, just to recognize those who've served in the armed forces for the United States of America and honor them in a special way as well. Following our morning service, we're going to have a, what we call our fifth Sunday fellowship. And everybody will move down to the school building, and we have a lunch that's going to be prepared down there. We're going to have a grill out, and we're going to have hot dogs and hamburgers and all the sides and fixings and things like that. And we would love for you to join us. And even if it's your first time or if you've been here a million times, and uh, we would love for you to join us for lunch this afternoon. It would be our uh, honor to have you with us. It'll be a delicious lunch. Hey, we're Baptist. We know how to cook. We know how to eat. So you won't miss out on that. So hopefully you'll join us this afternoon. But following our lunch, we'll come right back up here about 1.30. And we'll have a singing service this afternoon. Just our folks here at the church are going to present some, some messages and song. And then we'll have a brief devotion. And that'll be our day today. We won't be meeting back tonight for any of the other activities that we typically have on a Sunday night. So we would love for you to join us this afternoon for lunch. I know it will be a blessing to you. Other things going on this week, Tuesday morning at 1030, we have our Bible study, and you won't want to miss that. If you love to study the Word of God, this is a great time for you to get around the Bible. That's Tuesday morning at 1030. And then Tuesday evening at 630, we have our soul-winning visitation. We'll be going out in the uh, highways and hedges here, just across the street here in uh, Off Winton Road. And we're going to be knocking on doors and telling people the good news of Jesus Christ. So join us if you can Tuesday night at 6.30. And then Wednesday night at 7 p.m. is our uh, midweek Bible study. And we're going through the book of Proverbs. Been a very profitable study for us. And if you like to study the Word of God and to get around and just see what God has to say, this will be a great opportunity on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. We'd love for you to join us. This Saturday, our men will be meeting for men's prayer breakfast at 8.30 at Frisch's on uh, Galbraith Road. I also wanted to say that um, on July the 14th, we have a special guest speaker coming. You may have heard of him. His name is Dr. Lynn Gordon, and uh, we're really excited that Brother Gordon's going to be coming and preaching both services on Sunday, July the 14th. I know he's excited, and I know we're excited to see him and hear him again. So don't miss out. Sunday, July the 14th, Brother Gordon will be here with us. Please don't miss that. Next Sunday night, July the 7th, we have the tour group from Champion Baptist College in Hot Springs, Arkansas. They're going to come and present music and preaching next Sunday night, and you won't want to miss that either. These young people have a heart for God, and they just sing uh, with their hearts, a beautiful sound, a wonderful message and song. And then their tour leader, his name is Matt Thistle. He'll be bringing the message. He's a friend of mine, and I know you'll love to hear what he has to say from the Word of God. So that's next Sunday night. A few more things here. I've got a full, full slate this morning, so bear with me. We do have, um, uh, we have the Golden Agers. Uh, not only do they have a meeting coming up next month, but right now they're going to do a cleanup for the academy, for the school, on July the 12th. That's a Friday, and they'll, they'll meet here at 9 to try to just help any way they can down in the school building, to do some general cleaning and some things like that. So it'll be Friday, July the 12th at 9 a.m. Lunch will be served. And uh, Ms. Snyder told me to uh, make sure you sign up to help clean up. And she said, don't forget the young whippersnappers, too. They can come, too, not just the golden agers. So we'll, we'll take young people to help with that cleanup as well. We had this past weekend, on Friday, we had a kids' activity at the skating place. And we had 44 children show up for that activity. It was crazy. They just kept coming in, and we kept giving them skates and drinks, and they had a great time. We played some games. It was a wonderful activity. I'm thankful for all the adults who chaperoned that, and of course for the 44 kids who came out. You said, where did they come from? They came from everywhere. But it was great. Um, kids love skating, and they had a great time. So thank you for everyone who was involved in that. We also had a teen activity Friday night, and they were playing skyball softball in the rain. Now that's dedication. And, uh, but they had a blast as well. So we're thankful for all those activities. And one final announcement. Uh, I, don't, I don't like to uh, miss these. These are special announcements. Uh, Brother Sam and Ms. Lois Hensley, this Tuesday, will be celebrating 56 years in marriage. Amen. And we're just thankful for them. <laughs> that is a real blessing. And, you know, as the way that marriage is treated in America today, really and all across the world, uh, we want to lift up marriage, and, and especially when you have a couple who's been married for that long, and just thank the Lord for the testimony that they have here at the church. So we're thankful for them. At this time, we have another choir special. <clears throat>
Couldn't remember what I was supposed to do next. Let's all take our song books and stand. If you would, turn to page number 485. <clears throat> page 485, America the Beautiful. Heavenly Father, we're thankful to be in your house. And Lord, let me tell you, on behalf of myself and everyone here, we're thankful to be living in America, the greatest place on earth. Lord, we know only one place better to live, and that'll be in heaven we join you. So we thank you from all of our hearts. Father, we thank you for answering prayer we heard this morning. Now we ask it for the ones that are being needed for surgery coming up, for the ones not feeling well that need to come back and see us, Lord. We ask you to bless this service, Lord. We ask you to be in it. We ask that everything we do is to honor and glorify you. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. time we have a special by Jamie Keller. Half a century ago, two simple words declared a truth that's planted in our hearts. And every time the flag is raised, we've been honored to repeat the phrase so the world would know we are under God. America's been blessed. Under God, brought through every trial and test. We are sheltered by the mercy He chose to give in privilege and abundance. This nation lives under God. Freedom has survived. Under God, we need to recognize we're dependent on His goodness, indebted to His care. Maybe more. Time or anywhere 
have shaped the land that we hold dear. Some insist it's not allowed to acknowledge that we need him now, but it has never been so Appreciate that song. And uh, we as Americans, we need to realize and not just realize it, but to tell and to live that we're privileged because we're under God. And uh, not by the things that we have done. God has blessed our nation tremendously. And uh, we're thankful this morning for our nation and for the United States of America and for God's blessings. If you have your Bible, please get it open to Genesis chapter 18. Genesis chapter 18. <clears throat> if you didn't bring your Bible and you need one, we've got you covered. Right there in front of you in that black book, that's the Bible. If you want to take that out and get that open to page 14. Page 14, that's the Pew Bible there. If you need a, a Bible to look at this morning, we encourage you to look at the Word of God with us. Uh, we want you to bring your Bible, and if you don't have one, we want you to have one there that you can use. Because it's the Word of God that changes lives. And we want you to take a look this morning. So if you have a pew Bible, that's page number 14. And we're looking at Genesis chapter 18 this morning. <clears throat> I'm looking forward to our festivities this afternoon. Uh, looking forward to a good meal. I know we have some men down there right now who are grilling and preparing the food for us. And thankful for their sacrifice this, this morning uh, to help feed us this afternoon. And looking forward to our service this afternoon as well. And to hear the singing. Uh, just be a wonderful day. You know, as we celebrate America and uh, we're thankful to the Lord for what he's done here, it brings many emotions to us. And, you know, emotion is not a bad thing. Um, you know, some people are more emotional than others. Some people can see, you know, old yeller and they'll cry. Um, other people uh, can see anything and it doesn't bother them whatsoever. And, but emotion is not a bad thing. And to have emotions for our country is good. We ought to be, uh, we ought to love our country. We ought to have some uh, some fond thoughts of those who've 
given their lives for our freedom and for the rich heritage that we have in Christ in this, in this nation. But more than that, as we have heard the music this morning, <clears throat> we ought to have a heart for God. And uh, the music this morning has done a great job of balancing that out, of letting us honor our country, but lifting up our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And as I thought about this this morning and what the Lord has put on my heart, there's a poem that I'd like to read to you. Um, it's from a pastor. I'll tell you his name when we're finished with the poem. He wrote this in 1977. He's in heaven now. But in 1977, at a nationwide conference with pastors from all over the world, he wrote a poem about America, and I'd like to read it to you today. It's called, I Love America. It says, I love Thanksgiving when we pray, and July 4th and Labor Day, with picnics, ants, and hungry flies, and barbecue and hot french fries, with Cokes and chips and apple pies, beneath some hazy, lazy skies. Obviously, this preacher liked to eat, and you'll see that more here. I love Miami's royal palm that oozes forth a healing bong beside the ocean's quiet calm and Betsy Ross and Orville Wright and dear Ben Franklin's flying kite and Thomas Jefferson's mighty quill and Alamo and Bunker Hill and Paul Revere's midnight ride and Wilbur Wright's successful glide. I love United's friendly skies and baseball when the umpire cries, play ball as thousands quietly rise to turn their moistened, sober eyes toward waving flag that proudly flies. And Casey Stengel, Stengelies, and Dairy Queen, and Tasty Freeze, and Cotton Candy at the Zoo, and Corny Dogs, and Big Macs, too, and Burger Kings, and Shopping Malls, and Hockey Pucks, and Basketballs, and Mississippi's Cotton Fields, and Holland, Michigan's Spinning Wheels, Monotonous Midwestern Plains, Florida Sun, Seattle's Rains, Atlanta's lovely dogwood trails and Santa Fe's long clicking trails. I love the Rocky Mountain peaks beneath a sky which mutely speaks. And Disney World and Disneyland and Georgia's fertile blood red sand. The Mississippi and Rio Grande, Wisconsin's cheese and dairy land. I love McDonald's chocolate shakes and Minnesota's thousand lakes. The Royal Georgia's mighty yawn, a sleepy Alabama dawn the harvest moon that shineth on. I love to gaze at Yellowstone while looking on an ice cream cone, and Howard Johnson's motor lodge, and Ford, and Chevrolet, and Dodge. I love the stately Empire State, and San Francisco's Golden Gate. I love St. Louis' friendly arch, the Statue of Liberty's burning torch, the Washington Mon Monument's prickly goad, and Colorado's Trail Ridge Road. I love my country, tis of thee, O oh, blessed land of liberty, long may our glorious land be bright with freedom's wondrous holy light. Protect us by thy matchless might. I love to stand with hand or heart and think of those who did their part, who left a mom a lone gold star, whose bodies rest neath fields afar. I love New England's rolling farms, its quaint decor and blushing charms. I love the azalea's fresh and blooms, East Texas roses sparkling plumes. I love it when my church choir sings and know the peace that worship brings. There beats within my breast a dream that that small, faint, and flickering gleam will soon become a mighty flame to spread to all His matchless name. That those, who, those dear four who call me Dad will know the country I have had where freedom's flag flies proud and high and those dear ones may loudly cry, I'm free! My dad helped make it so. That faint small gleam is now aglow. That Christian land that he once knew is now the kind that we know too. God's judging hand has now been stayed. So I and mine are not afraid. For churches like our own abound in every city, village, town. We're free to witness, visit, teach the same dear truths we heard dad preach. And now we vow to God above to pass it on to those we love. That was written by Jack Hiles in 1977 at Pastors Conference about the country that he so loved. And this morning as we've looked at that poem and we've heard from his heart, his love for America, I'm sure that some of those things he said really brought a, a memory maybe to us of some of the things that we love about America. And I know probably each of us could stand this morning and just talk about how we love our country and 
the blessings that God has given us and, and how we love the countryside that we have here, how vastly different that it is and how beautiful and uh, how ranging that it is, how fertile our land is, how God has blessed us like he's blessed no other nation on earth. And he's done it because our founding fathers started this nation based on the word of God. I've never had the privilege to go to Washington, D.C. I hope to get there someday and tour all the buildings. I know some of my family just recently went, but I know that from testimony of those who've gone and brought word back that you cannot go to one of our national mon monuments without seeing something that relates to God, a scripture verse, or maybe just even using the term God, or talking about how he has done so much to get this nation started and blessing it as we go. And uh, you cannot deny, you can try, and you can use all kind of language that would try to deny it. But you cannot deny that America was founded on the principles of the word of God and that she has been singularly blessed because of God's blessings. And we're thankful for that this morning. You know, as we look at America today, we see that our economy is not in great shape. Our physical health is faltering. Americans are on more medication now than they've ever been. We as a people are apathetic about just about everything, except maybe money and celebrities. It seems like America has its eye turned towards lots of things except for God, the one who made it so great. And this morning, and we find ourselves in a nation that needs to be turned around. And I by no means want to make this morning a, a morning where we uh, are angry or disappointed or upset about our country. There's enough of that going on. But what I want to do is say, is there something that can be done. When we find ourselves in a, in a manner like this as a nation, is there something that we can do or that God can do to turn this thing around before it's too late? And I believe that there is. And I believe we can see examples in the Word of God. And this morning we're going to look in Genesis chapter 18 and see an example where God was getting ready to destroy a nation and how he said that he would spare it if he found some things. Let's look at Genesis chapter 18 this morning. We'll begin reading in verse 17. <clears throat> Genesis 18, verse 17. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which is come unto me. And if not, I will know. And the men turned their faces from thence and went toward Sodom. But Abraham stood yet before the Lord. And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Peradventure there be fifty righteous within this city. Wilt thou also destroy and not spare the place for the fifty righteous that are therein? That be far from thee to do after this matter, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked. That be far from thee, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And the Lord said, If I find in Sodom fifty righteous within the city... Then I will spare all the place for their sakes. And Abraham answered and said, Behold, now I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, which am but dust and ashes. Peradventure, there shall lack five of the fifty righteous. Wilt thou destroy all the city for lack of five? And he said, If I find there forty and five, I will not destroy it. And he spake unto him yet again and said, Peradventure, there shall be forty found there. And he said, I will not do it for forty's sake. And he said unto him, O let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak. Peradventure there shall thirty be found there. And he said, I will not do it if I find thirty there. And he said, Behold now, I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord. Peradventure there shall be twenty found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for twenty's sake. And he said, O let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak yet this once. Peradventure ten shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for ten's sake. And the Lord went his way as soon as he had left communing with Abraham. And Abraham returned unto his place. Let's pray this morning. <clears throat> 
Our Heavenly Father, as we come to you now and before your word, we think about this great nation that you've blessed us with. Lord, how you have protected her by your might. How you have blessed this land with fertility, Lord, and we have an abundance of just about everything that we need. Lord, you've given us so much, and to whom much is given, much is required. Lord, we stand this morning hurting for our nation, a nation that has, in many ways, turned its back on you. A nation that, in many ways, is trying to get your name out of commonplace. Lord, we as your people come before you today, and we just ask that this morning, as we look at your word, you would speak to our hearts as to what we can do. Lord, if there be any way that we can spare this great nation, I ask that you would just put it upon our hearts and let us see from your word, Lord, how you have promised to do so in the past. Lord, I pray that you would help your people to get serious about this matter at hand. Lord, that we may be a nation that would not just be a great nation in the eyes of the other countries, Lord, but would be one that would send the gospel to those in its own borders and to those outside. God, I pray that you would use America to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ throughout its land and the whole world. And Lord, let it begin here at Central Baptist Church. Lord, I pray if there's somebody here this morning that needs to be saved, that they would get saved before it's too late, even this morning. And Father, I pray for those of us who know Jesus. I ask that you'll do a work in our lives. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> As we turn our attention to the word of God, we see this dialogue between Abraham and God. God had said that he was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah because of the wickedness in that land. If we were to look this morning in the very next chapter, Genesis chapter 19, and we were to go from verses 1 through 29, we would see the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. We would see why this nation was destroyed. We understand from the word of God that Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed because of the wicked sin that was taking place. You see, according to the next chapter there, Genesis 19, there were some angels that came down to the earth here to Sodom and Gomorrah and to see what was going on. And they came unto the only believer really in that land who was Lot. And he sat in the gate, which means he had a place of prominence in that city. And those angels came to Lot and they said, what's going on? We've heard this is wicked. God has sent us here to destroy this place unless something happens. Well, it was evening and Lot lodged those men. He told those men to come into his house and stay the night. Lot knew what he was doing because at nighttime it got really wicked in Sodom and Gomorrah. And the Bible says the men of the city young and old, came to, came to Lot's house. And they asked that Lot would send those men, those angels, out into the, to the front there so they could do unto them what they wanted to do. Great wickedness. Incredible wickedness. The wickedness that is per, uh, perverting our land right now, and that is homosexuality. And that's what they wanted to do. And, and Lot said, no, I won't do it. He said, but take my daughters. They haven't known a man. And he was willing to give those men, those wicked men, his own daughters. Well, as those wicked men came to the door, the, the Bible says the angels smote them with blindness so they couldn't even see to get to the front door. And the angels took Lot and his family and they got out of the city and God rained fire and brimstone on that city because of the wickedness that was found there. You see, God does judge. There are consequences to choices. And this city, this place, Sodom and Gomorrah had found the end of its rope. It had been wicked long enough, and God was going to make an example out of this place. They would not repent. But before all that happened, Abraham had a conversation with God, and we just read it. And Abraham said to God, I know how you are. You're a merciful God. I know that you love people. And I'm asking that if you would find 50 righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah, God, would you not destroy it? And God said, if there was 50 there, I won't destroy it. And Abraham went back and he said, Lord, maybe 45. If you could find 45 righteous people, would you not destroy it? And God said, I won't destroy it if there's 45. I think Abraham knew something about Sodom and Gomorrah. He said, God, um, what about 40? What if there's only 40? Would you? And God said, I, I won't destroy it if there's 40 righteous people. And Abraham went to 30, and Abraham went to 20, and he finally got down to 10. And Abraham said, God, if there are 10 righteous people, will you still destroy it? And God said, if you can find 10, I won't destroy it. 
<clears throat> you see, Lot had been there for a while. Lot had been there for a while. His family was with him. There should have been at least ten righteous people in that city. But they could not be found. So God destroyed the city because of its wickedness. You know, this morning, for the sake of America, there needs to be a remnant. There needs to be a remnant of righteous people. People who live by the word of God. People who won't be involved in wickedness. People who won't kowtow to the, the day of, of sin and the wickedness that we find in our land. But people who will stand and be right and live right and do right. We need that in America. And it won't be the lost. The lost are lost. They're not going to be righteous. They're not going to live by the word of God. It must be God's people. Those people who know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Those must be the people who will live right and do right. So God can look at America and find a righteous remnant. That's what we need today. And it needs to start right here at Central Baptist Church. We can look all around and just, oh man, the world's bad. The world is bad. The world's supposed to be bad. Well, the churches are bad. Well, you know what? Some churches are going to be bad, but the only thing we can control is us. I can't control another church. I won't control another person. I control me, and sometimes that's a big-time job. The only person that I can control is Phil Keller. And I will answer to God for that in my home and for this church. But we as individual, individual believers have to decide that we are going to live right and do right. Doesn't matter what anybody else does, we're going to do it right. God said he'll spare a nation if he'll find the righteous there. Let's look at four applications that we can draw from the scriptures this morning. <clears throat> how can we spare our nation or how will God spare our nation? What is he looking for to spare the nation? Well, number one, we need to plead for our nation. We need to plead for our nation. Look at verse 23, Genesis 18, 23. says, And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Abraham drew near. You know, Abraham communed with God. He went to the Lord on behalf of that city. He went to God and said, Lord, is there something that can be done? Is there a way that you can stay your hand of judgment? And God started to give him some ideas. God said, if I can find some righteous people there, I won't destroy it. But you see, God went, or Abraham went to God on behalf of his nation. Let me ask this morning, how many times do we pray for our country? How often do we go to the Lord and pray for those higher powers? And whether we agree with them or not, it doesn't matter. We're supposed to pray for them doesn't matter if we agree with them or not. We are to pray for them. And we need to pray for our country. Abraham prayed for Sodom and Gomorrah. He prayed that God would not destroy it. We need to pray that God would stay his hand of judgment on America. Pray to the Lord. That's one way. Number two, we need to command our families in the way of the Lord. Look at verse 19. 19, for I know him. This is God talking about Abraham. He says, for I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may be upon Abraham, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. God says, I know Abraham, and I know he will command his home to do right. Men, we need to command our homes to do right. It's time we stop stop counting on our wives to do it. It's time we stop counting on our schools to do it. It's time we stop counting on the youth leader or the Sunday school teacher or the pastor or the government to do it. We need to command our homes right. And God said, I know Abraham. And I'll answer his prayer because I know that he will command his home right. Men, are we training up our children in the way they should go? Are we teaching them about the Lord? There's a difference in teaching them about the Lord and taking them to Sunday school, by the way. We need to tell them. And Abraham told his family. He trained them up. And God knew that about him. Look, we can't control the neighbor kids. We look at them, we see them in Walmart screaming like memes, and we get upset and mad. Oh, those parents. Take care of home. 
Take care of home. I think it's crazy too, but take care of home. That's what we can handle. And God was looking for a righteous remnant. First of all, we need to plead for our nation. Second of all, we need to uh, command our families in the way of the Lord. Thirdly, we need to reach those around us. Very simple observation from here. Very simple observation. God said, if there are ten righteous people in that whole city, I'll spare, the, I'll spare it. I won't judge it. Abraham, or Lot had been living there. Lot had his family there. And listen to me very carefully. If Lot had been a soul winner, there would have been at least ten righteous people in that city. That's a fact. But you see, Lot was not interested in telling others. Lot was interested, obviously, he was in the gate of the city. I mean, he had a place of prominence. He was like in the city council. He obviously did not tell others about the Lord. He wasn't making a difference where he was. Look, we get a vote in elections. We do. We get one vote per person. That's the way it's supposed to work anyway. Sometimes <clears throat> some of those other organizations get in there and People vote early and often on election day, but people who are doing it by the law vote one time on election day. But you know what? You want to see how to get the right people elected? If we had more Christians, they could vote the right way. If we were to lead more people to Christ and they were to get saved and they were to learn about the Lord and about the Bible, when they go to the voting booth, they would vote the right way. Honestly, we have been lazy. We have been lazy as believers. We've not told those around us, and our country is suffering because of it. And we have nobody to blame but us. We can't blame the Jehovah's Witnesses. We can't blame the Catholic Church. We can't blame anybody else. The people who have the Word of God need to be spreading the Word of God. And we can help. Fourth thing that we'll see this morning, and finally, God will spare a nation that has a righteous remnant. Verse 32, and he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak yet but this once. Peradventure ten shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for ten's sake. Not only do we need to plead to God for our nation, we need to command our children in the way of the Lord, we need to be soul winners, but we need to do right as God's people. We need to be salt and light to the rest of the world. You know what? How many times in the Bible does it command us to bring glory to God? That's what we're made for. That's what we're made for. We're made to bring glory to God. And the way that we do that is living by the book, being an example to those around us. God's not going to look for our politicians to save our nation. He's going to look to his people. Turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 7 with me. 2 Chronicles 7. If you have one of those black Bibles, the pew Bible there, that's page 414. 2 Chronicles chapter 7. Second Chronicles chapter 7. 2 Chronicles 7, 14. God said, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. There's four things there. There's four things there that God says, if you will do this, I will heal your land. Number one, humble, humble ourselves. Humble ourselves before God. Number two, pray. Number three, seek his face. What's that mean? That means go after God hard. Like we go after money sometimes, like we go after materials sometimes. Go after God. Seek his face. Find him. Search him out. Commune with him as Abraham did. And number four, turn from their wicked ways. Hey, God didn't tell us to try to turn the sinners from their wicked ways. He said for his people to turn from their wicked ways. I'm talking about saved people need to turn from our wicked ways. He said, you do those four things, I will hear from heaven and will heal your land. That's right there for us. 
And everybody says, well, Brother Keller, that's, that's the scripture you're supposed to preach on Fourth of July and Memorial Day and Labor Day and all these times, Veterans Day and all these things. You're supposed to talk about with my people, which are called by my name. Yeah, we get it. Well, guess what? Somebody's got to say it because if something doesn't happen soon, we know where we're headed. And I'll stand in this pulpit every holiday if I have to, and we'll read this scripture as long as God puts it on my heart. Because it's time for his people to be his people. And to stop living like the world. The Bible says, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. A lot of gods in this nation. But we as his people need to make him our God. According to the word of God, look, there's a way out. <laughs> he said it. It's right there. He gave us the plan. He didn't say, well, things are bad. Hope it turns out okay. See you in heaven. That's not what he said. He said, there's four things. Do these four things and I will hear from heaven. And I will heal your land. He's looking for a righteous remnant. question is this morning, will we choose to be that remnant? If you'd stand with me, please, and our musicians would come. This is a moment of invitation. We're inviting you to come forward and do business with God. You see this morning, if you're here and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, the most important decision you can make, the most important decision you need to make in your life is not about marriage, it's not about your job, it's not about where you're going to college and all those things. The most important decision in life is, do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? I didn't ask, do you believe that there's a God? I didn't ask, do you know that Jesus saves? I said, have you ever personally asked Jesus Christ to be your Savior? If not, this morning, I'll be standing right down there in front of those flowers. You could come forward and say, preacher, I need to be saved. And I'll take the word of God and show you how you can know Jesus as your Savior. If you're here this morning and you're born again, God's speaking to your heart about being that remnant. What do we pray for our country? Do we seek God's face? Do we humble ourselves? Are we willing to turn from our wicked ways? Maybe this morning we need to come down to this old-fashioned altar and just do business with God. If you're here today and you've been saved and you've never been baptized, maybe you need to come forward and say, I want to be baptized. You become a part of this local church. Maybe this morning you've been coming to church here for a while and God's speaking to your heart about joining our church. You can come do that this morning as well. As Brother Tim sings, you obey God and do business with Him.
been a good morning here celebrating our God and Country service and got a lot more stuff coming up in just a minute, but we are grateful this morning. We've had a family come forward to join by letter. We have the Lakes family. We got Don, Loretta, Donnie, Zach, and Andrew. I knew that just like that. Come on up here, everybody. Come on up and join us so everybody can see you. And um, these are my nephews. That's my sister and that's my brother-in-law. And uh, we're just, this is an answer to prayer. And we're just thankful this morning for them. They felt the leading of the Lord to come join us here at Central Baptist Church. And uh, we're just so thankful for them. Good family, good, good folks, most of them anyway. And uh, <laughs> now we love them all. They are good folks. And you're going to get to know them and love them. I know you've already got to know them a little bit. But uh, in the coming months and years, it's just going to be a blessing. And we're just so thankful for what the Lord's doing here at Central Baptist Church. So we need to take a vote. Is that right, Brother Paul? We need to take a vote. All right. All those in favor of the Lakes family joining by the uplifted hand? And any opposed by the same sign? I notice none. Good. All right. Well, if you all can go right over here in the first pew, we got some special uh, recognition this morning. I would like to recognize all of the people who've served in our armed forces, and we're going to ask them to come forward and just remain standing so it's easier for them to get out. If we could have anybody who served in the United States Army come on up here. Anybody who served in the Army come on up and stand on this side of the auditorium. Come on. Don't be, don't be shy. You get something. You get a gift if you come on up. It's a short walk and you get a gift. All right, anybody who's served in the United States Army, we'll have them stand over here. And our girls are back there ready to give, bring the gifts here in just a minute. All right. Thank you, men. All right, any who served in the Air Force, United States Air Force, come on up and we'll have you stand right here on, in front of this section. United States Air Force here, Army over here. All right. Here comes Brother Thompson, all decked out, looking sharp, man. Air Force right here. Army over here, we'll have the Air Force here. Looking great. Love it. Not many people can still fit in their uniform, brother. That's good. <laughs> all right. Let's have all those who served in the Navy or the Coast Guard. Come right over here. Navy or Coast Guard. Anybody like that? Here comes Brother Bob. Anybody else? All right. Brother Sims. Navy and Coast Guard will have you come right here. Thank the Lord for these men. Brother Sims, come on up. Brother, we love you. Appreciate your service. And finally, those who served in the Marines, the United States Marine Corps, you come on over here and stand on this side. Nobody's allowed to yell hoorah or anything like that. <laughs> I guess if you want to, you could. Go ahead, Chris. Go for it. Hoorah! There you go. boy. <laughs> I know it's in there. They just got to get it out. So United States Marine Corps. All right. All right, ladies, you come on up and bring the gifts. Make sure every man up here gets one. And uh, it's not a wedding, girls. Come on, a little faster. There we go. <laughs> They're all so cute, aren't they? All right, go ahead and hand them out to the men here. We have just a small gift to let you know that we love you and that we appreciate your service to our nation. And only God can reveal in heaven what some of you men have meant to our country and the things that you've been through and the things that you've seen and endured so that we could be free. And we sure are thankful for that this morning. And so as a church, let's let them know how thankful we are. We sure do love you, and it's just a small gift, and we wish we could do more, but we want you to know that we appreciate you, and we know that we're here today because of people like you all over this nation who've sacrificed for us, and we want to be mindful today also of those who could not be here with us because they paid that ultimate sacrifice, and we're thankful to the Lord for that. Let's have a word of prayer. We'll thank the Lord for these men. We'll thank the Lord for the food to come, and then as we're dismissed, I want you to come forward. Thank all of these men. Welcome the Lakes family to our fellowship. And then, now don't go too fast, and then we'll head down and we'll have lunch, okay? So we'll pray now, and this will be for our food as well. So once you can get down there and get your plate, dig in. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today, Lord. We thank you for the men who are standing up here, Lord, and the sacrifice they paid for our country. Lord, they stood for freedom. They fought for freedom. They were willing to go. And give of themselves for someone else. Lord, we thank you for them this morning. 
Lord, we thank you for your protection over them and for bringing them home safely. Lord, we do pray for those men and women who are on the battlefield as we speak, all over this world fighting for freedom. Lord, we pray a hedge of protection around them. We ask that you would keep them safe. Lord, that you would bring them home safely to us, please. And Lord, we offer a prayer this morning for those families who are grieving because they've lost loved ones. Men and women who fought for our country that we could be free, who never came back home. Lord, I pray that you'd bless those homes and those families. God, I pray that you'd give them an extra measure of grace. God, we can't necessarily feel what they feel, but God, we love them and we ask that your hand would be upon them. Lord, we do thank you for adding to our church this morning. Lord, the blessing that you've given us. Pray that you bless this family to serve you here. And Lord, we do pray for the food we're about to receive. We ask that you bless it for our use, Lord, and that we would, Lord, give you glory for it. We love you, Lord. We thank you for such a great day here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Men